Okay, in this video, transmission line lecture number three, we're going to talk about arbitrary loads on AC transmission lines with sinusoidally varying signals, where again, we're assuming that everything on our circuit is all varying sinusoidally with the same frequency and that, that frequency is known. All right now, in the last lecture, we considered what happens when you have open circuits or short circuits at the end of the load, uh, at the end of the line as our load. We also considered what happens if you have inductors or capacitors. In this circuit, we're going to expand to arbitrary loads, which um, basically means any combination of resistors and inductors and uh, capacitors that are, that are on the load. So in part one, we're going to just talk about resistors on their own, and we'll contrast that with the uh, um, open and short circuits. Then we'll define the input impedance of resistive loads. And then in part three, we're going to generalize to arbitrary loads that have some combination. And we'll talk about different techniques for impedance matching uh, for situations where you, you don't want to have any reflections coming back to a, um, to a source. All right, so let me begin by uh, uh, reintroducing a concept that we call the standing wave. And the standing wave simply means that we have a wave moving in this direction. And in this case, we're going to have the phasor value as a function of z, right? So this is the phasor value of this wave that's moving in the positive direction. And this will be equal to uh, some constant value, which I'm gonna write as v positive, and a zero to indicate that that's the phasor value at z equals zero. And the way we adapt that phasor uh, as you go to different locations of z is simply by multiplying it by e to the minus j beta z. Beta was the wave number, it's two pi over lambda. It simply tells us that if you move uh, one meter, how much has the phase changed if you have two points here that are separated by a meter? Then what is the phase shift between points A and B? Works out to be beta times Z. All right, so that's the positive. Uh, there is another negative going wave on top of this that may or may not exist. And this will equal to V0 negative as tilde and E to the positive J beta Z because it's moving in the positive direction. Because, sorry, because it's moving in the negative direction, you have a positive sign in that complex exponential. All right. Now, a standing wave is when you have a positive and negative going wave superimposed on top of each other. So this would be V as a phasor as a function of Z will be the sum of those two. V positive zero of E the minus j beta z, and that's a phasor, plus v0 negative constant value times e to the minus j, sorry, plus j beta z. Uh, v positive and v negative are constants that simply describe what is the phasor value of the positive going wave at location z equals zero, and the same for this negative. Okay, now let's look, let's examine this for a second. And let's ask ourselves the question, what is the amplitude of this right here? All right, so let's think about this in terms of phasors and in terms of the complex plane where we have one over here and we have j, this is minus one and this is minus j. All right, so this first term right here is going to correspond to some vector, maybe it looks like that, all right? And the second term will be pointed in a different, potentially in a different direction. And this represents a negative going wave. As Z increases, the blue and the green are moving in opposite directions. In particular, uh, for the green, uh, this would be increasing Z. because the phase reduces as you increase your Z. And for the blue, we're gonna rotate the phaser this way as we increase C, Z. Because for the blue, increasing Z is the opposite direction. It's sort of upstream of a river um, that's sort of, that's, uh, that's um, a flowing. Uh, so upstream, you're basically gonna rotate in the clockwise direction. Now you can imagine that there is some uh, location of Z where the blue and green are gonna overlap each other and they'll point in the same direction, all right? 
that is what we would call constructive interference because that's when the amplitudes of the sine waves perfectly line up. And at that location, the amplitude is going to be the sum of the amplitudes of B0 positive and B0 negative. All right, so we're asking a question. What is the amplitude? Let me indicate this question mark. All right, what is the amplitude of the phase or value of this total wave as a function of z, right? The highest it can be is going to be the length of E0 positive plus the length of E0 negative. And that's the best case scenario in terms of the intensity, all right? The worst case scenario is um, there will be some point when the blue and green are opposite each other, right? Where the green is pointed, uh, let's say, up and to the right, and the green and the blue is pointed down and to the left, and they cancel each out as best as they possibly can. Uh, if that's the case, then we take whichever number is higher, and that's going to be what's left, right? So this will be b zero positive length of that minus b zero negative. Right, so whichever one is higher, um, put that on the left, and uh, that's going to be what's left. So if the green is higher, then take the green length minus the blue length. And in the worst case scenario, where you have destructive interference, that's what you're going to get. So this is constructive. And this is destructive. All right. So we're going to define something called the standing wave ratio. And the standing wave ratio is basically the ratio of the highest possible uh, phase or amplitude we can get to the lowest possible phase or amplitude we can get. All right, and if we write that down, we're gonna define this as a term called VSWR or VISWR as it's sometimes called. This is called the voltage standing wave ratio. And it's going to be a measure of how far apart the maximum and the minimum are away from each other. All right, so it's basically going to be the ratio of the maximum voltage to the minimum voltage. All right, so it's V max divided by V min. And this works out to be, uh, take this term over here divided by that, uh, that bottom term. Now, we have an extra thing going for us, which is we actually know how V0 negative is going to compare to V0 positive because we know the reflection coefficient. Right? In other words, V0 negative, the intensity or the amplitude of V0 negative will be equal to the magnitude of the reflection coefficient times V0 positive as a phaser, right? So if I've got one volt going in a positive direction and it encounters a load where the reflection coefficient is a half, I know I've got a half volt going that way. So if they sum up perfectly, it's a half volt plus one volt, and that's one and a half. If they cancel each other perfectly, that's one volt minus a half volt, and I've got one half that's remaining. So Basically, we're going to have a one plus absolute value of gamma in the numerator and a one minus absolute value of gamma in the denominator, right? This is going to be our definition of the voltage standing wave ratio. And this is gamma L because it's the reflection coefficient at the load. And what it basically tells us is, let, let's do a couple of sanity checks, all right? If the reflection coefficient is zero, right? The, let's say the load is perfectly matched to the line. If the reflection coefficient is zero, then the voltage standing wave ratio will be equal to one for a uh, perfect match. Let's say we have an open circuit or a short circuit at the end, in which case the reflection coefficient is either positive or negative one, and so the absolute value of gamma L is one. So now we've got one plus one divided by one minus one, which is infinite. 
right? So this is equal to infinite for, let's call it a horrible match. A horrible match being either a short circuit or an open circuit. They're the same. They both have a horrible match, um, but they give you a voltage standing wave ratio of infinite. All right, so this is one way to define this idea that we've got a wave that's going this way and we've got a wave that's going that way. Uh, how big is that wave in comparison? Uh, so the voltage standing wave ratio is basically the ratio of the standing wave to the propagating wave. All right, the propagating wave is the size of the wave that goes toward this, the the, uh, the load and is absorbed there, right? Um, so this uh, um, this voltage standing wave ratio is uh, v max over v n, and let's um, take a look at uh, um, uh, at exactly how this acts. All right, so. So I want to, I want, let's consider the following situation sort of qualitatively. We have a transmission line that has a 50 ohm load, sorry, a 50 ohm intrinsic impedance, and it ends with a resistor that's 100 ohms, okay? Now this is a scenario where we're gonna get some reflection at the uh, load, right? There's gonna be a non-zero gamma L, but it's only going to be a partial reflection. Some of the voltage is going to basically stick and be dissipated by that load. So if you think about this, this is sort of in between two different scenarios. It's kind of like an average of two things, right? The first scenario is when you have a perfect match, right? Where you've got a 50 ohm line connected to a 50 ohm load and the other scenario is where you have a 50 ohm line connected to an open circuit, right? 100 ohms is in between 50 and an open circuit. So this is kind of like in between these two. So let's write down these three scenarios, right? So uh, we've got the matched load We've got the 100 ohm line, and we've got the open line. All right, so let's uh, look at this in a couple ways. So for the match load, let's start by talking about the visoir, like the voltage standing wave ratio. Okay, for the match load, going back to our definition of Visoir equals one plus absolute value of our load reflection coefficient divided by one minus the absolute value of our load reflection coefficient. Uh, visoir for the match load is going to be one because gamma L equals zero, all right? For the open line, gamma L is positive one, in which case we get one plus one over one minus one, which is infinite. Okay, for the 100 ohm case, let's figure out what that is. Gamma L equals 100 minus 50 over 100 plus 50, which equals one third. Okay, so we have one plus a third divided by one minus a third, which turns out to be two. All right, so here we can sort of see the 100 ohm line is kind of like a linear combination of the perfectly matched line and the opened line. All right. So let's kind of take a look at what this looks like with wind TLS. All right, I'm gonna start by making my voltage source into a sine wave. And I'm gonna make a load into an open circuit, sorry, a short circuit. Let's simulate this, I'm gonna speed it up. And we're gonna wait until this settles out and reaches sinusoidal steady state. For that, we're gonna wait until the sinusoid propagates to the end. It's gonna reflect. It's gonna work its way back to the generator side and at what point it will be absorbed. 
All right, let's check the envelope button. All right, now let's take a look at this for a second. The voltage standing wave ratio is simply asking the question, what is the highest voltage you can possibly see divided by the lowest voltage you can possibly see as a function of location? All right, so the highest voltage is any one of these peaks, right? Uh, take that value. In this case, it works out to be about one volt. Each of these tick marks is a half volt. So at the highest point there, the V max, the maximum voltage is one volt, right? This is the amplitude of a phaser at this location is one volt. The standing wave ratio is the ratio of that divided by the minimum voltage that you can see. So if you visually inspect this and find the point with the smallest voltage, it'll be right here at these little nodes. This is called a node there. Over there, there appears to be no voltage oscillation at all. If you were standing there with a voltmeter, you would see nothing. You would think that there is never any voltage anywhere. In fact, you would not realize potentially that anything is actually happening. So in this case, the voltage standing wave ratio is two divided by zero, which is infinity. All right, so that's a perfectly matched line. And again, this interference pattern simply comes about from e to the uh, negative j beta z plus e to the positive j beta z, the positive and negative going waves superimposing on top of each other, forming this wave that bounces up and down, but doesn't actually move anywhere. And that's called a standing wave. All right, um, let's look at a perfectly matched case. This will be a little simpler because once this wave hits the load, it will be absorbed, nothing else will go back the other way and we're done. All right, and if I click on this envelope button, you'll notice that we're no matter where you go, you're gonna measure the same amplitude everywhere. Right, the voltage value is the same. Uh, and this makes sense. Our reflection coefficient is zero. And so our voltage standing wave ratio or our visoire is also one uh, because there is no change. There's no up and down modulation to, uh, to this wave as a function of location. Let's pick something now that's a little bit in between. All right, I'm gonna go somewhere in between a perfect match and a short circuit. Let's how let's how about do 25 ohms. Let's simulate this and watch what happens. And again, this we're gonna to have to wait for the wave to hit the load, reflect and go back. When it reaches the generator, the reflected wave will be absorbed and then we'll be done. We'll be in sinusoidal steady state and we are there. All right, let's click on envelope and let's take a look at this. All right, uh, what have we got here? All right, we've got a wave that sort of was in between as we expected. Right, there is an element of bouncing up and down that you can see, that's the standing wave portion of this. But at the same time, this bouncing wave is moving to the side. It's clearly, it's clearly carrying information uh, toward the load. So there is an element of propagating wave to this as well. The voltage standing wave ratio, all you gotta do is, is take this peak value here and divide it by the minimum value and that's your standing wave ratio. All right, so again, it's just a peak voltage divided by the minimum voltage. So the standing wave ratio ranges between one and infinity. All right. Now the question that we're going to, that, to answer in the next section, just to give you a little bit of a preview, is what is the input impedance of this circuit at different locations? All right, so that's this concept that if I change the length of the transmission line uh, and, and I put a voltage into those two points, then what is the apparent impedance that I see? The total voltage divided by the total current. And we can take a guess that it's going to vary as a function of length. And to see that, I'm gonna click briefly on current. So you see that the current and voltage are acting pretty differently and have kind of a different pattern to it. So the input impedance is going to vary as a function of length. And in the next lecture video, we will quantify that precisely.